excited. We are starting week number four in our series, Discipleship Series, everybody. And, and, and what we've been doing is really trying to define what a disciple is. We, we really believe this, this is the heart of our church, and we're really excited that, you know, part of sometimes church is that it can get really cluttered, and uh, sometimes you cannot know what's the main thing. And I want to encourage you what the main thing is. The main thing is that we are all disciples of Jesus Christ. And here's what I recognize is this, is that God is not coming back for church goers. Bible says that he's coming back for disciples. And I, I want to encourage you uh, is that we're called to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so I just pray uh, that you are leaning into this series and you're learning what it is to be a disciple of God. In fact, can you put a definition of the disciple, what that means? Uh, we kind of define it. A disciple is a person who is learning how to follow and obey the commands of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. It is someone who is learning how to follow and obey the commands of Jesus. And I pray that you get that in your spirit. In fact, what we created for you all as a resource are these cards. And uh, on these cards, it talks about the five marks of a disciple. It talks about the five identifications of a disciple. You want to know what a disciple is? Just look at this card. And we, we really try to really spell it out so clearly and so simple and basic so that we all can re recognize what a disciple is. And hopefully we can use it as a measuring tool and put it up next to our lives and see, are we really disciples of God? Uh, we we kind of, uh, this is the fourth week uh, and, and, and we've talked about spiritual growth. And how a disciple is somebody who has spiritual growth in their life. They're, they're, they are growing in their walk with God. They're not the same. Come on, like the Bible says this, that we go from glory to glory, from one level to the next, right? Come on, like you should not be at the same spot that you was last year. Like you should be increasing in your walk with Jesus, right? You should be getting closer and closer to him. And that's spiritual growth. Number two, last week we talked about the idea of service. Disciples are servants, and I know that this is everything contrary to the American gospel that we've been presented because you come to church for you, you come to church to see your word, and, and God said, no, 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 we are servants, meaning this, we don't come for us, we come for him, and we come to serve him, and many of us are going to have a really hard time in heaven because you think that when you get to heaven that God's going to be like, hey, how can I serve your agenda? How can I build you a nice house and on the street of gold? No, 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 that's not biblical. What, what, what's going to happen is that we're going to go around the throne room of God, and we're going to worship our God, and we're going to ask our God, how can we serve you, God? Right? Because we're servants of the Most High God. Today, we're going to talk about small groups, the idea of gathering together and having people in our lives. Uh, it's going to be a great word today about this, the idea of community and biblical community that a disciple has in their life. You know, next week, we're going to talk about the idea of sharing the Gospels. I really believe that it is so important that we share the message of Jesus. And the week after that, we're going to talk about stewardship. Um, and I, I just pray that today that you lean into this series in the next few weeks as we learn what it is to be a disciple of God. But I do have a word for you. I, I'm going to uh, teach from a scripture that I've never really t taught from when it comes to this subject. Genesis chapter 1. I'm, I'm a, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start off with some theology then get into some teaching. Then hopefully we've got time. I'll do a little preaching at the end. But, uh, but I, I want to real quick uh, go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28. And this is the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord simply says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image. God's referring to the Trinity. And he's saying, let us make man into our image, our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. It says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the fish of the sea and all the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on this earth. This is God's words. But I want to go back to that one, the first words of God in verse 28 says this, and God blessed them. And the first words that God said to mankind is this, be fruitful and multiply. Amen. That's his first words to you and I. Like it's, it's the first words of God to, to mankind. Be fruitful and multiply. 
And I'm not just talking about childbearing here. We're going to learn here in a second that that's not what he's just only talking about. And though he's talking about that, it's not the only thing he's talking about. Uh, because you, because if that's the case, then Jesus was not fruitful. If that's the case, Paul was not fruitful. So what I'm saying here in this text is that the first words of God is not just to have a whole bunch of babies. And although he wants us to have a lot of babies, except me, he don't want me to have a lot of babies. He's just, it's good with you. Come on. He want Paul and Kiera to have all the babies. Come on, somebody. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and to do it. I, I want to talk to you about that today. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you may speak to us. God, give us a word, Lord. We need to hear from you. And God, in a world with such chaos and such violence and such craziness, God, give us a word that's going to inspire our faith so that we can go and change the world. And I pray that you may, uh, I pray that today's like a, like a, the troops are gathering to hear from our commander in chief, God. Give us, us our marching order so that we can go out and live this out in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> I mean, well, I'm excited about today because today we're talking about small groups and talking about gathering together. And I just want to real quick let you know that in, uh, in Christianity, especially when you look at the New Testament, uh, we were not meant to do Christianity by ourselves. We were not meant to do this alone. In fact, God did not create this for us to do this alone. And, uh, and what the problem that we have, the, the, the issue that we have, and I love that we live in America. I love this country that we get to worship our God freely. I am so grateful that I'm here. But the problem is that we live in what we call an individualistic society. And what that means is that everything is individual, right? And, and so that when you come and meet Jesus Christ, you come to the altar by yourself. I remember in Africa a few years ago, uh, I went to a mission trip and we were doing a crusade in South Africa. And uh, after the crusade, we did an altar call and thousands of people came to the altar. And I went to one section on, on one side and, and I'm like, I am so grateful that you guys all made net with Jesus. And one guy screamed back to me and says, no, it's only one of us, but we all rolled together. And it, it, it was it, it was a, a revelation for me that most of the world view their Christian faith different than the way we you and I grew, view our Christian faith because we're individualistic in our understanding. But if you read the New Testament, you will see that their faith was formed in the context of people. They, they, they didn't do this thing by themselves. They didn't come and meet Jesus by themselves. They didn't grow in their walk with God by themselves. And I just want to convince you and I that if we're going to thrive and be the people that God's called us to be, we need to do this thing with each other. We're called to do life together. We're called to, like, I, I, this is supposed to be a family reunion. Every Sunday should feel like a family reunion. Come on, somebody. Like, that's, that's what this thing's meant to be. Right. And this is why I think it's so important that we gather constantly and that church attendance is not just something that you check off, but something that you lean into because we are meant to do this thing together. Let's go to some theology real quick. I want to look at Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, uh, you know, it is the story of the creation. And, and, and there are two sections of things that God created, things that were living and things that were not. And when he talked about the things that are living, when he created everything that is living, he created it with seed on the inside of it. So when God created a tree, he didn't just create a tree, but he stuffed in a forest inside that tree. When he created tomato, fruits, veggies, right? What he did was he created it, but then he stuffed it with seed so that it can multiply and be fruitful, right? So nothing that he created that was living that was made without potential. So that when he created you and I, he created us stuffed with seed, stuffed with potential. This is the theology that we live by. And real quick, if anybody who's walked in here today and your life feels stuck and you feel like you're in a rut, I want to encourage you all today that there is something on the inside of you that you have not tapped into yet. Because you see your life, but God sees the multiplication that he stuffed you with. Come on, somebody. 
I remember taking my kids to Build-A-Bear. Anybody take their kids to Build-A-Bear? Come on, I love Build-A-Bear. And I love the idea of Build-A-Bear. You grab this lifeless bear that has nothing inside of it. It just limped. Come on, somebody. And then you, you, you buy all the accessories that go with the Build-A-Bear. And then you do to my favorite part. You bring it to the lady who works at Build-A-Bear. And then she stuffs this Build-A-Bear with all this foam stuff, all the cotton. And she presses this button. And all of a sudden, the thing is filled with cotton right away. I feel like, and I want to remind you today, that when God created you, your life was lifeless and your life was limb, but he brought you to the potential machine and he stuffed you with potential. Yes, yes. So when God sees a tree, he don't see a tree, he sees a forest. When God sees a, when he, when he sees grapes, he don't see a grape, he sees a vineyard, right? Because that's how our God thinks. When he looks at your life, he don't just see your life, he sees the multiplication and the seed that he stuffed you with. So every day that we wake up, we should wake up with the idea of what potential I'm going to walk in today. There are some things inside you that you don't know that's in you. Come on, somebody. There, there, there is so much in you. And so this is why God says, because there is so much in you, go be fruitful and go multiply. Because I stuffed you with potential. Bible says this in verse 28 of this text. It says this, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and go multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the fish of the sea, all the birds of the heavens and every living thing that moves on the earth. This is the word of God that you and I have been created with potential. We've been stuffed with potential. And no matter how old or young you are here today, you are filled with endless potential. No matter what your past looks like and mistakes you've made, you are still filled with potential. Your sins and your drama don't pay in your past does not ruin the seed of God that's happening in your life. Come on. Your sin is too small in God's power, in God's house, to ruin the potential that he stuffed you with today. So today you should recognize and thank God today that you are filled with potential. That you have not seen the best that God has for your life. Yet, come on, somebody. That should make you clap your hands real quick. First service, clap your hands. Second service, quiet today. So, real quick, all I want to do is kind of, kind of. I love the idea that we are filled with potential. But here's what happens. The Bible says in verse 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, "Be fruitful and multiply." But guess what? They were not Adam and Eve were not able to be fruitful and multiply until there was intimacy involved. What I'm trying to tell you today, that intimacy unlocks the potential that God has stuffed you with. Whew, that's good. Yes, that relationships unlocks the potential that God has stuffed you with, right? And I just want to real quick let you know that everything and every blessing I have in my life, it, it comes from God, but it comes through people. Whew, I'm going to say that one more time. Every blessing that you have in your life is going to come from God, but it's going to come through people. This is why God created it in such a way that in order for the potential and the seed that God has stuffed you with at creation, in order for it to be unlocked, it must first be in the context of intimacy. And I'm not just talking about childbearing today, y'all. Come on. (laughs) And I'm not just talking about what you know what today, y'all. Come on. I'm talking about the idea of multiplication and fruitfulness overall and the idea of intimacy in general relationships. Here is what I know, that you are stuffed with so much seed and potential, and it will remain in you unless you get intimate with other people. So what I want to just kind of communicate with you today, that you are not meant to do life alone. You are, meant, you are not meant to do this thing by yourself. Here's why. Because you cannot unlock the seed by yourself. So what I want to do is I want to give you some quick teaching real quick on the idea of what this means for our lives and how we are made up. I want to real quick talk to you about four areas of our lives that we're made up of, right? The first area I want to talk to you about what I call the arena part of you, the arena part of you. This is the part where I know and you know that part of me because that's the part I told you, right? It's the, you only know the part that I told you about. You really don't know the real me 
you only know the arena version of me. And the sad part about the American Christianity Church and uh, disciples of God is that many of us never lead the arena part of your life. People only know the parts of you that you tell them. That's right. That's right. And as a result of this, we have the church is just filled with, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know what other Greek word to say it, but I feel like the church is filled with a whole bunch of fake people. That's right. Because we only know the fake part of us, the part that we present to church. Come on, everybody. Uh, my life is perfect. Hallelujah. I love Jesus. Praise God. My marriage is perfect. We have no issues. My kids love Jesus. They don't make mistakes. They don't talk back like your kids. My kids are amazing. And I feel like in, we're living in a culture. Anybody ever been a part of a church where people just, they put on? Like, they put on the fake them, and this is what I call the arena version of you. And this is why, real quick, a lot of lost people don't want to come to church because it's filled with a whole bunch of arena people. We only see the stage version of ourselves, right? And, and, and I, I think there are some leaders and some people and pastors, and including me at times, where I only give you the fake version of me. I don't give you the real me, right? You know what I'm saying? I think it's important that we get out of this place. In fact, here's what I want to recognize. I love this one verse. It says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It says this, So we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Amen. Meaning this, if you're going to, be, if you're going to unlock what God's going to do in your life, you got to escape the arena version of you. And the arena version of you is only the stage version of you, the version of you that you know and I know only because you told me, but you don't tell me you're junk and you're mess. That's right. I want to encourage you all today that this is so important that you leave out, of, you get out of the arena version of you because if you never get out of the arena, then you would never walk into the full potential that God has for your life. And this is so true. I remember, uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was in youth ministry. I, I was, I was in high school and we had a youth leader that took, uh, me and some other uh, students. We went to Manpower, Megafest, yes. TD Jakes. Come on, somebody. And I mean, you want to talk about an environment that was powerful. It was amazing. I mean, I'm in 10th grade and this was like men from all over the world came to worship God. That room was powerful and it was amazing. You heard Bishop T.D. Jakes, get ready, get ready, get ready. You better. I mean, when he preaches, you like, you're like, that's God speaking. Come on. <laughs> so I never forget that. It was an amazing time. And then they had like this, uh, this luncheon for those who came from the furthest away. And I got a chance to meet Pastor T.D. Jason. I mean, he talks how he preached, man. He, how you doing, son? I'm like, oh, I'm like, this is great. So like a couple of weeks later, I get back home in Miami and I'm preaching one of the first sermons I've ever preached. I'm in 10th grade. It's going to be a great time. And you will never forget who I started, who I wanted to preach like. Come on, somebody. So your boy got on that stage like, and God says... God's going to touch your life. And, you know, you know, and I always like, I always thought it was weird when preachers preach like they don't talk. You know, it was weird. But I started doing the same thing. And I got off the stage and my, my mentor says, that's not how you talk. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like that's how God's going to look at all of our lives. That's not the real you. That's a pretend version of you. And what I'm saying is this, that if we want to unlock the potential that God's put on inside of us, we have to be and we have to remove ourselves from the arena version of ourselves. Because here's what I know, you would never walk in your potential. Number two, second part of you is the mass part of you. This is the part where I know and you don't know. Come on, somebody. <laughs> This is the part of you where you, you're going to hide this from everybody. And here's what I want, I want to listen to this real quick, that you will always be as sick as your secrets. Ooh, Jesus. And you will never unlock the potential that you would always mask up. And I just want to create a church environment where we don't have to wear masks all the time. I'm not saying that you got to share the whole world your business, but you got to find a few people in this church that you're going to share your business to. You got to find a few people who's going to know your, your junk. You got you, you to gotta find some people in your life that knows your struggles, that knows your issues, because here is what I recognize. I love what the Bible says in Proverbs, whoever conceals their sins does not prosper. 
But the one who confesses and renounces, they are the ones that find mercy. You don't believe it? Let's go to James chapter 5, verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Guess what? You get forgiveness from God, but you get healing from your people. So what I'm trying to tell you right now, this is why I really believe that it's the enemy's goal to keep you isolated because he can keep you from being healed and walking in your purpose. And I don't want to have a church of people carrying around masks, wearing masks and being the freak version of you. Come on, it's time to just get real and be the real part of who you are. I remember when I was in college and I had a really bad struggle and an addiction to porn. And it was really bad. I would be good for three months. Then life would get stressful in school. Then I'll, I'll, I'll fall down. I'll be good for three. I, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm going to get through this, man. I could do this. And I, never, I, and I was in Bible college. And I was on a preaching team. And they would send us all throughout Florida to preach at different camps and different churches. And, and I felt so bad. And I just, I, I fought this fight and I would, I would be good for, for a few months or a few weeks and I'll make a commitment and a covenant with God. God, I will never look at porn again. I will never do it. And I've got all the apps that blocks up on your phone and your computer. And it was just, it was just so bad. And I'll never forget. I did it the night before I looked at porn. I went to Chick-fil-A and that's right when they came out with a spicy chicken sandwich. Come on, somebody. I'll never forget this. It's in my mind. Come on. My life is evolved around food. Here we go. And I'm taking a bite, and I was right in front of my friend, Austin. And I said to myself, I got to tell him. And so literally, I put the sandwich down. I said, Austin, I'm struggling with porn. And you will not believe what happened. Austin says back to me, I am too. And this was over. This was over 15 years ago. And from that day at Chick-fil-A, eating a spicy chicken sandwich, I've never looked at porn since. And it's not because I was strong. It was because I confessed. And what I'm trying to tell you right now, you can never truly get healed unless you take off the mask. And I think we live in a church culture where I know some of you have been hurt by people. They learned your junk and then they abuse your junk. And therefore, you don't want to tell nobody your junk because some people have used your junk. But what I'm trying to tell you right now is that I, this, is, this is less about people knowing about your junk. This is more about unlocking the seed and the potential that's inside you. This is about unlocking the potential that's in you. I recognize that, that there, are, there are things in my life that I got to confess and I got to tell my brothers and sisters about because if I don't, I will stay stuck in a rut. I want to encourage you right now that the moment you confess and the moment that you take off the mask is the moment that God unlocks the seed that God has placed on the inside of your life today. And this is the, this is the, the disciples. This is what a disciple does. They, 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 they take off the mask. They don't, they, they don't live in an arena. They don't wear a mask. But number three, the second part is called what I call the blind spot. This is the part where I don't know, but you know. Come on, somebody. This is the blind spots part. And I pray that we all get here at one time in our lives where you have people around you that sees areas of weaknesses that you can't see. I like what John Piper says. He says this, and one of, one of my favorite quotes I've always, he says, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Meaning this, that sometimes you don't have a real perception of your, of the real, of your real self. We sometimes fake it so much that we begin to believe the fake version of us and not the real version of us. We can lie to ourselves so much that we start to believe our own lies that we got it all together. And God would tell us today that you cannot trust you sometimes. I like what the Bible says. The Bible says in Jeremiah, it says this, the heart is deceitful above all things. The heart's deceitful. Sometimes you can't trust you. And sometimes you need other people to see the blind spots of your life that you cannot see. I have mentors that tell me all the time, hey, Trap, you, you ain't living right. You, your life is too fast-paced. You're too scattered. 
You're traveling too much. I got people who see these things in my life that I don't see because I see a good part of me because that's what I want to see in me. And so then I end up lying to myself and thinking that I have my life all together, but really I don't. And this is what happened. When you live in isolation, you only see the part of you that you can see. And you don't allow other people in into your life and you have anybody into your marriage, into your walk with God, into your career and your business. As a result of that, you are sick and stuck and filled with potential and not walking in it. And God would tell us as a disciple of Jesus, the reason why the disciples were so successful was because they always gathered together. You look in the book of Acts 2.42, one of my favorite verses, and they gather together constantly. After that, they experience persecution. They get locked up. And when they get set free from, by God from the prison, and guess what they go do? Go get into Acts chapter 4. Go gather again in the house. They face persecution again. And the Bible says this, and they gather again. Here's why. Because it was the gathering that gave them the healing, but more importantly, that unlocked the potential of the disciples changing the world. So, so in the book of James, so James, the, the, one of the, the leaders of the church, the brother of Jesus, he writes to a people that they call the diaspora. These were the spreading of the Christians because here's what the enemy recognized is that he can spread you apart. He got you isolated. He gets you isolated. You don't get healed. You don't get healed. You don't walk in your potential. Amen, amen. And so I want to encourage you all today that we got to have people in our lives so they can see our blind spots because if they don't, if we don't allow people in, then we will always be stuck. So you got the arena part of you. Let's get past that. That's the only part that, that's the part that I know and you know because that's the part I tell you. Then you got what I call uh, the mass part of you. And that's the part that I know, but you don't know because I'm going to hide that from you. And then you have the blind spot part of you. And that's the part that I don't know. And it's the part that you know, and because you see that in your life. And, and just real quick, it's important to have people that's, that call out your blind spots. And if you're too prideful for people to call you out, then you're in trouble. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, I had somebody in our church call me out. And, you know, and I know historically, you know, pastors, you know, we, we got this authority and that no one can call us out and no one in our church. No, no, somebody called me out. Uh, I, 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 I get invited to every graduation party, which I love. And I love being a part of the celebration. And uh, this one young person invited me to their graduation party. I said, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, I'm, you know, you guys know my personality. After church on Sundays, I'm always happy. and like, yeah, I'll be there, whatever. And she says, are you sure you're going to be there? I said, yeah, I'll be there. She said, well, you said you go to my party last year, but you never showed up. And she says, I, I, I'm, uh, are you overcommitting? And I'm like, why, why is she calling me out like that, you know? So I went back home and processed a day. I processed every summer and every Sunday with my wife. And uh, that Sunday night, I went to Brittany. I said, man, this girl said I, I, I'm overcommitting. She said, yeah, you are. Yeah. She right. <laughs> you always overcommit. And so this past, yesterday, I had five graduation parties that I committed to, and guess what I was doing? I didn't go golfing. I went to all five graduation parties, y'all. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> I committed to it. I gave them my word, so I was going to show up. And I, I say that to say is that I'm telling you what, you got to have some people in your life, and you got to have a posture in your own heart that people can call you out. Because you, you, you have such a prideful posture that no one can call you out in your blind spots. And it's so funny, I have young, young couples come to me and they're struggling in their marriage and they're having a hard time in their marriage and they're not connecting emotionally anymore. They're not dating, they're not having fun together anymore. And then they come into the marriage counseling room and they, they tell me, well, we should be doing this and doing that. I'm like, no, 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 stop listening to what you're saying to yourself. Stop listening to you, okay? Like, stop and allow somebody else to pour into your life and call out the blind spots that you don't see, Right? Because you will always be as sick as your blind spots. And I'm, the last point that I want to make real quick, then I'm going to hit into some other points, is this. Is that you got the arena part of you, the mass part of you, the blind spot part of you, but then you got the potential part of you. This is, I don't know, and guess what? You don't know. It's the potential. It's the part that you don't see. It's the seed that's on the inside of you. And guess what? The potential part of your life would never be unlocked unless... Is in the context of intimate relationships. I think about one of my favorite characters in the Bible. His name is the Apostle Paul. 
The Apostle Paul is responsible for bringing us pastoral theology, biblical theology, salvation theology, eschatology, ecclesiology. He was responsible for writing over two-thirds of the New Testament. He is the one who brought the gospel outside of the, Gentile, outside of the Jewish world, into the Gentile world, into Asia. And you and I are right now, we have a, the gospel presented to us because of people like the Apostle Paul. But before his name was Paul, his name was used to be Saul. He was an enemy of the church. He hated God. He hated God's people. In fact, he consented of the death of Deacon Stephen in Acts chapter 9. This guy was an evil person. And the Bible called this guy named Ananias to go out to this guy named Saul, who eventually becomes Paul, who eventually changes the world. Guess what? There will never be a Paul without an Ananias. Because uh, and you, and you read Acts chapter 9, the Bible says this, God called him to go to, to Paul's, to Saul's house, uh, to a house that Saul was in. And the Bible says this, that Ananias called him brother, and then they fellowship with one another. And it was the intimate relationship that started in that moment that unlocked the potential of Saul becoming Paul and writing two-thirds of the New Testament and changing the world because of an intimate relationship. I say all that to say is that who is the Ananias in your life? One, then who can you be an Ananias to? Because there are people, and this is why church attendance is so important, because God wants to unlock the potential in you, but God wants to use you to unlock the potential in somebody else. So when we gather, it's not just about us. So when you don't feel like coming to church, sometimes it's just not about what you, you feel like. Sometimes there's a word of encouragement that God can give you. There's a prayer that God can lay on your heart that you can pray for somebody. And as a result of that, it can unlock something in somebody's life that you never thought that you can do. I promise you, if you walk into an area of, uh, of intimacy in your life, you will see God do something amazing in you like never before. So for, for the next five weeks, what I'm going to do every single week, I'm going I'm to talk to you about different small groups that are coming up. And we're just going to just throw small groups at you, like just throw it at you, you know. Um, and because we recognize this is so important, I'm going to talk to you about three small groups that's happening. Uh, that's starting up soon. And we got some more. We got some men's ones starting up, some ladies ones starting up. And it's going to be great. And if you want to lead a small group, come let us know. We want to, we want to have as many small groups as possible because here's why. We really believe that it's the context of small groups that you will start to see this stuff unlocking in your life. Go to that first small group. What's the first one? Okay, that's me. I'm leading a small group every Thursday. And it's called a freedom group. And what I'm going to do for every Thursday, I've cleared up my, my travel schedule. I've, I've canceled conferences that I was supposed to speak at. And for the next six Thursdays, I will be here every Thursday night right here in the church. And we're, we're going we're gonna to learn how to get free. Some of you are not walking in freedom. There's some things that's happened in your past, and we're going to learn how to get free. And then, therefore, we're going to do this for six weeks. And then in, in the fall, we're going to do a freedom conference where guest speakers are going to be so amazing. It's going to be amazing. Right? So I'm doing a small group every Thursday night, 7 p.m right here at the church. Go to the next one. We got next one. We got, anybody know Byron and Vicky? Don't we love Byron and Vicky? They're, 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 they're going to they're gonna lead a, a, a marriage small group. We got more marriage small groups coming out, but they're leading a great marriage. And I don't know if you know Byron and Vicky, but they are just, just amazing people. I'll tell you what, my business has gotten better because of Byron and Vicky. My life has gotten better. My, my golf game's got better. Come on, somebody. Uh, 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 but what I'm trying to tell you right now, some of you got it. Some of your marriages are stuck. And, and I really believe that it's in the context of relationships in that small group that intimacy and fruitfulness in your marriage is going to happen. I got another one real quick. Now, one more, and then we, we'll, we'll talk about the ones next week. We got a young adult small group that's meeting here every other Sunday after the second service. They're going to stay here, and they're going to apply the sermon into their everyday life. And they're going to walk with each other and uh, eat some food every now and then. And, and so they're going to be meeting here at the church. But I, I tell you about this, it's because it's so important that you do that. In fact, you can go to motivation.church slash groups. Motivation.church slash group to sign up for all the small groups uh, that's coming up. And here's what I recognize, that, that it's in the context of a group of people that you commit to, that the potential that God has stuffed you with gets unlocked. Now, there are two things that happens in our lives that keeps us from doing this. Two things, the two Ps. Number one, the reason why it's hard to connect with people, because they're people. <laughs> and people are people. Come on, somebody. Some of you have been hurt by people let down by people and you don't trust people and some of you got some unforgiveness in your heart and therefore you said you would never let somebody in and I want to tell you right now 
It's time for you to give the, forgive the past. Forgive past leaders. Forgive past drama in your life. It's time you forgive that and for you to let people into your life. It's time. I, I, I think it's time for, 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 for some of you to deal with your pride. The second thing that, that keeps us from doing this is pride. You think that you can do this by yourself. You think that you can overcome your addiction by yourself, that you can do life by yourself and do finances by yourself and do marriage by yourself and do parenting by yourself. You cannot. You've got to have a tribe. And I'm telling you what, something special happens when we connect with one another. Something amazing happens when we say, you know what, I'm going to connect with my church family because when you connect with a church family, things begin to unlock in your life. There are people in this church that's helped me out. People like Byron that's helped me out. People like people like Marianne. She has a business that gets your face looking nice. Come on, somebody. Help you out. Like, like people like Matlock got a beat business. Come on, somebody. You got people like over there that has a, a, a accounting business. You got all these people in our church. And some of you will never get unlocked because you're isolated. So today, I want to encourage you. Let down your pride. Let people in. Let people see the junk, and I promise you will experience healing, but more importantly, you will walk into the potential that God has for your life. Amen, somebody? Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise. Come on, give a stand to your feet today, everybody.